again, our, our focus in dealing with bullying has been on the victims. So this is just a good introduction to the victim's perspective. Now, bullying is pretty persecuted, you know, a, a pretty bad problem. If you look at the statistics, in sixth grade, over a quarter of the students report being bullied on school property. It does decline to half that by the time they become seniors. Cyberbullying, which we're not really going to talk about, stays in the six or seven percent range the whole time. But I want to point out to you that there's something interesting about these statistics. The statistics talk about bullied on school property. Lots of kids get bullied when they're not at school. So these statistics are bad, but they understate the problem. The kinds of bullying that occur. There's the stuff that isn't so bad, you know, made fun of, called names, subject to rumors. But then we get the stuff that's really bad. Threatened with harm, pushed, tripped, spit upon, made to do things they don't want to do, have their property destroyed. <coughs> These statistics are ugly. And nationally, the guesstimate is that one third of all students will have been bullied sometime during their K-12 year. We're talking about a pervasive problem. Now, the traditional approach to dealing with this, and this is a book that came out this year, and it talks about <coughs> what the traditional approaches are in great length. But the traditional approaches have been to try to get bystanders to intervene, because there's a great statistic, 65% of the time if there's an intervention, whatever happens stops. That's a good number. It talks about having compassion for the bully and the victim, trying to understand the bully's frustration, and of course we get into a lot of stuff about school climate and trying to get kids to work together and have respect for one another. And I'm going to go off on my 60 seconds about the word respect because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> respect has two syllables, re and spect. So re is again, and spect is to view. So when you think about respect, what you're trying to think about is that you're going to have repeated interactions. You're going to see people again and again and again. And if you use that as your base and compare that to what you might be willing or unwilling to do in a one-off, respect is very important. So it's the seeing again. Now, this is the latest bullying study. And this just came out in May from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And it's a very interesting study because it talks about while all of the stuff that has been going on to date bystanders, school climate, getting kids to work together has been good. It has missed a very critical variable. And that is when you deal with the bystander, when you deal with the school climate, you are doing nothing for the psyche of the poor kid that has already been victimized. The kid that has been bullied. And again, that's our focus. So with that, I'm going to give you a brief introduction from one of our partners, uh, something called the Great American Noble Challenge. I'll come back to that more later, but here we go. What if life was like a multiple choice test, A, B, C, and D? all of the complexities of life reduced to four rudimentary choices. Of course, there might be more than one right answer. The thing is, life is full of choices. Sometimes we ignore our options because they're difficult or uncomfortable. But options are always there. No matter the situation, you are always armed with the power of choice. Yes, choice is a power. Use it. Don't abuse it. So everyone has choices. It's a fact of life. Unfortunately, it's also a fact that bullying exists. You can block it out, you can cover it up, but it's always there, like an underlying stink that you can't get rid of. I have a proposition. What if we confront bullying instead of ignoring it? 
What if we portray the victims as strong rather than weak? What if we give the bullies options rather than condemn them? What if we empower the victim and the bully through choices? Let's say your friends backstab you. They make fun of you online and you feel like you have nowhere to turn. Despite how powerless you may feel, you're standing at a crossroads. You have options. For example, A. You can believe them. B. You can get down on yourself. C. You can worsen the situation. D. You can lose yourself in alcohol and potentially fatal pills. Do all of these options sound bad? They should. This is how you see the world when you think like a victim. But if you change your mindset, you reveal a wealth of new options. A. You can brush off the cynics. B. You can find someone who will listen. C. You can remove yourself from the situation. D. You can ask for help. Sure, you can't control your bullies, but you can control how you react. Despite how it may seem, you hold some degree of power. Don't let your critics convince you otherwise. Let's flip the coin. What if you're not the victim, but the bully? Let's say you come from a troubled home. Each day you take out your resentment on your peers, who learn to fear you. Though you're ashamed of your behavior, you can't imagine another way to be. Consider your options. A. You can continue bringing others down. B. You can take out your rage on yourself. C. You can reject all attempts to help you. D. You can become the criminal everyone expects you to be. Or. A. You can bring others up. B. You can forgive yourself. C. You can accept help from others. D. You can prove the naysayers wrong. In the end, the choice is yours, whether you're the bully or the victim. You can choose to channel your emotions into tearing others down, or you can fuel them into the creation of something beautiful. Life isn't as simple as A, B, C, and D, but you always have choices. You should never feel trapped, powerless, or isolated because you hold the key to your own release. Use the power of choice to set yourself free. So you'll notice in that video that they went through almost all of the stages of the bullying cycle. And the sad truth is, most kids that get bullied, if they don't find a way of dealing with the psychological damage that they've gone through, end up either as bullies or later in life as abusers. And it is really critical that we do what we can to break the cycle. But you can't break the cycle unless you deal with the victim. So what you've got to do is you've got to think about what you can do for the victim. And I mean, the, the video shows you what the victim can do for themselves. But the question is, what can we do to help the victim? So the key is the psychological damage comes from feeling powerless and feeling humiliated. So what is it that we can do that can help them not feel powerful, not feel humiliated? And it's, it's an answer for the word that's become very 
you know, cliche, but it does work, which is empowerment to make a big difference. So Most anti-bullying efforts rely heavily on bystanders to take action, leaving your child with no protection. The No app aims to change that. Now your child can summon the assistance of a policewoman to tell the bully no, and you get alerted in real time with a map of your child's location. With video evidence, the bully's parents can be confronted, and school officials will be motivated to take action. You get increased peace of mind, and your child gets increased self-confidence. So that's the brief introduction to the app. Now, let me walk you through how the app works. And again, as it noted, it's available for iPhone, it's available for Android, and it's that magic price, that great four-letter word, free. All right, so it's really, you know, it, it's there. So let me walk you through it. The first thing that you do if you are the victim is you activate and run the app. Now, where's the empowerment? The victim is deciding when they're ready to have a discussion or a little confrontation with the person bullying them. That's in their control. And they know what's coming, and the bully doesn't. So the first thing that happens is they activate the app. They say, hey, Billy, look at this. And when they do that, what comes on, depending on the version, is either a policeman or a policewoman. And the policeman and poli policewoman are saying, you were told no. A video of that no is being recorded and saved. Just what is it about the word no that you do not understand? No means no. And when the policeman finishes, a nice stop sign appears and it informs the bully that a video of them watching that message has now been safely uploaded to the cloud. So the app has created evidence of the bully being told no. Oops, sorry. So the next thing that happens is that the app notifies the parents, and in real time. So when the kid hits the button, the parents get an SMS message and an email message that says the app was activated, and here's a map of where your child is. So depending on the situation with the parents, they know to either have a discussion at home that night or to jump in the car. Now, I'm going to point out to you that there's a cycle with these two things that's also important. And that is the educational part. The parent and the kid put the app on the kid's phone. That's discussion number one. The kid's a kid. What is the kid going to do sometime in the next 24 to 48 hours? Press the button. Right. And what happens? And what happens according to number two? So this means the parent knows to have a discussion with the kid that night. That's discussion number two. Now, the kid's a kid. What's going to happen over the next week to 10 days? They're going to run it one more time with a friend or a sibling. And, but now we have something magical. You're all teachers. Three discussions is the key. We just got through their heads. So the app is going to trigger the three discussions before they ever set out to use it, just by the notification cycle. So that helps. Now, the next thing that happens is that the video is encrypted, stored offline, and is only available to the correct authorities. So in the instance of kids with the bullying app, that's the school, the police, child welfare, a court order if somebody goes to get one. It is not available to the kid, it is not available to the kid's parents. We don't want to create videos that are for black men. But now we have another empowering decision to make. The parents and the kid have to decide they've made the video, what do they do? Do they want to talk to the school? Do they want to talk to the bully's parents? Do they want to do both? They can do Either of these things. Again, another empowerment. So, what we suggest to the kid is, you know, if the bully is now saying, still, still hanging around and hasn't fled, you know, 
Remind me, you now have a video. And there's nothing they can do about it. It's there. It's in the cloud. It's gone. I see a question. Do they have to have sales service to do that? Can you store it offline and then it upload itself later? It will upload whenever they get to service. Okay, so they so have it like on an iPod. If it was a child that had an iPod or something like it that. It won't work on an iPod. It only works. I mean, we have discovered it does work on an iPad, but it only is intended for phones. I was just thinking about some kids if they didn't have that, they might have some other type of device. And the other problem with an iPod is it wouldn't be able to display the video. The iPad would do the pod would. All right, so let me walk you through this again, but now let's focus on what this actually can do. So the first thing that it does is it's empowering the victim. And that's the key to all the stuff that, that we do in, in these things. We have another set of apps for sexual assault and domestic violence that also are focused on empowering the victim. All right, so we're not relying on bystanders. We're not talking about changing school climate. Those things are still important. I'm not here to tell you they're not. But I'm here to tell you that we've all been not doing enough to try to break the cycle by focusing on the victim. The victim is, who is our big issue here. All right? The second thing that it does is it empowers the parent. They get notified in real time. They know to have a discussion or not. They know what what's happening. This is an empowerment tool for the parents. It encourages reporting. This is no longer he said, he said, she said, she said. There's now actually some piece of evidence. It's hard for the the bully to argue that they won't, aren't that person sitting there in the video. So there's something going on. And having that little bit of evidence can be a big motivator for something actually happening. Because let's face it, it's very hard to get in the middle of the he said, he said, she said, she said. You don't know what's going on. But evidence and parental involvement make a big difference. I mean, a huge difference. So the other thing that can happen is this is not just bullying. Let's face it, that we still live in a society where strangers come along and try to do things to our kids. This is a way of getting rid of the stranger. So let me ask some questions. What's your general reaction so far? Dead silence. Uh -oh. Well, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, um, about how, about it going straight to the parent. Because one of the issues we already have now in our high schools is when something gets started in the school field and the first thing the kids do is call parents. And then we've got 10 angry parents coming up trying to fight before we even get a chance to come to the school them. So I'm, you know, I worry about that piece. Um, because that, like I said, that's an issue right now. We have kids that will call parents, uncles, cousins, somebody's messing with me, and then we got a big incident in the school because parents are coming into the building in the middle of the school day trying to handle something, and the administration doesn't even know what's going on. So that's my only concern. And that's already an issue, so it wouldn't be because of that. Well, our kids can't use their cell phones at school. So this would be something. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See what we're reporting is that we the person know, but yet we're still missing the actual incident that occurred. Right. Well, again, I, this is not about trying to create a video record of the incident. This is about trying to give the poor kid that's been bullied a sense of empowerment that there's something that he or she has control of. Because that's where the empowerment is. It allows them to tell. Right. At least start the dialogue. Right. Because if they can do that, they don't have to take it out on somebody else. They don't have to hold it in. It doesn't become this gnawing thing that turns into big problems later. It's they actually have a means that's within their control of dealing with the person that is causing them the distress. So, you know, it's not for getting outsiders to do something. It's for letting the person who's the victim feel that they've got some sense of empowerment and control. Because that's the only way we're going to get that cycle broken. 
Calling in a bystander can stop the incident, but it doesn't stop the pain. Doing great programs in schools so that things don't happen, well, that's marvelous. If we can get it so that things don't happen, that's great. But the poor kids that have already been victimized still have their stuff to deal with. And that's what that national report pointed out is we overlooked that. In an effort to prevent the future, we haven't dealt with the damage from what's already occurred. And there's this cycle. So if you don't deal with the damage that's already occurring, you're just planting the seeds for future problems. All right, so let me ask a question. What do you think would happen if we go through all this, so two people, have, there's been a bully, there's been a victim, et cetera, and the bully is really an obnoxious SOB, and a few months later starts it again? You have a record of the repeated. Okay, so let's, but let's be more immediate. So the kid goes to pull out the phone to deal with the bully. What do you think happens? Make it, break it. Good. Okay, good. So now let me show you the next thing, because there's this little interesting thing when that happens. The minute that the kid whose phone this is on hits the button, it's recording video. So, if the bully tries to see steal or destroy the phone, taking and breaking phones is actually a crime. The police actually know how to deal with that crime. Now, I'm not suggesting they're going to go arrest an 11-year-old. That's not the point. But it's a whole lot more meaningful when the police can show up and say, do you know your son stole or broke this? And there's a video of him doing it? So we'll go back to the video of the incident. If you actually are attacking the phone, well, the phone is recording you attacking the phone. And no matter how hard you try to break the phone, it's going to upload that thing to the cloud. Because it takes a truck to break the circuit board. And not many kids have access to trucks to run the phone over in the next 30 seconds. So it's going to get uploaded anyway. Yeah? You might want to say something about having multiple email addresses. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, so that, that was sort of into the how this all works. Now, the idea is it's an app, it's a tool, it is not a be it all end all solution. It's one more thing in the arsenal. But it's something that each kid can have for themselves. And having it for themselves, again, is the sense of empowerment. It promotes a good dialogue between the kid and their parents. Now we've got some really good partners. So for example, the people that made the video that I showed you, the Great American Noble Challenge. Have any of you heard of them before? No, okay. This is a group that's primarily sponsored by 4-H. And they encourage kids all the way up through college to make videos and public service announcements about bullying, suicide, uh, drug problems, etc. And they run a national contest and get a lot of celebrities to then give awards. And they're looking for anybody and everybody to submit these things. So that's what that was last year's winner that I showed you as an example. We've got some people who go into schools give anti-bullying talks as partners. We've got authors that write kids' books about bullying as partners. I mean. We're not suggesting that we're, oh, that we're something that works on, you know, all by itself in isolation. It's part of a package. But we think we are a critical missing piece, which is what can be done so that the victim feels a sense of empowerment. Now, if it works, we're the only thing that, that does it, because there's nothing else out there right now for the victim. And I've got to give you the magic word. All right, so let's just talk. Oh, and by the way, please, we've got all of our stuff up at bullyingstops.org. So what I would really urge is please get the word out.
parents, principals, superintendents, PTAs, everybody. It's free, it's on iOS, it's on Android, it works, it's available now. When they go to register, it will ask for the phone number of the phone that it's being installed on, and then there are two slots for phone numbers for the parents to put in their phones to be notified, and there are two email slots for notification. So if there's somebody other than the parents that the parents want to notify, they can. But whenever that button is hit, those four addresses will get a notice with a map letting them know that this, has, that this has occurred. So maybe you would want to set up an address for your school to be notified that it comes in for them. I mean, we have a couple of schools that are using it where they give out iPads. So because of school equipment, they've already built in into the app that one of the addresses is them. Yes. Yeah. I guess, always to me, I've never dealt with one that didn't act like they were the victim. Eric, I think we're ready for you. <laughs>